Another version of that, which is called the stibodium, is so named because in this case the diners are arranged in a semicircle, but on a cushion directly on the ground or floor. This comes from a first century wall painting from a tomb in Rome. Now I wanted to bring those up because that is the standard style of dining pictured on Christian catacombs in Rome from the second century through the fourth century when they are picturing ceremonial meals they were having, perhaps primarily funerary meals in honor of deceased, uh, particularly deceased saints, but this is, shows you how the custom was embedded within the Christian culture. Now meal customs of the day emphasized the ritual of the meal, which focused on sharing of food and wine together, that it was a community forming event. And so also early Christians were significantly shaped socially and theologically by the ritual of feasting together. Paul refers to this when he speaks of the sharing of bread as a ritual that creates the body of Christ in 1 Corinthians 10:17 with the phrase because there is one bread we who are many are one body for we all partake of the one bread Now the house church is frequently mentioned in Paul in this example from Romans 16, Paul identifies a house church being hosted by Prisca, also known as Priscilla, and Aquila. Since Paul is greeting them in the letter, they are therefore hosting this church in Rome. And throughout these greetings in chapter 16, he names several other house churches in Rome. Later in chapter 16, Paul refers to a house church hosted by Gaius. In the the term translated host here is a Greek term xenos, which has a, a generic sense in the Greek world to refer to the one who offers hospitality to the stranger. This reminds us that the process of gathering guests to be received into one's home was an act of hospitality. Usually, the paterfamilias, or the homeowner, is a, of course the one who rel welcomes guests into the home, and then they would be directed to the dining room, where the host would provide a meal worthy of the honor he wished to be bestow on his guests. So hospitality was a basic ritual for gathering the community together in the house church. And it was also a component of the larger complex cultural ritual of hospitality to the stranger, which had been embedded in the various cultures of the Mediterranean world for several millennia. You're probably, probably many of you are familiar with the version of this story found in the Jewish tradition of Abraham at the Oaks of Mamre, a story in Genesis 18. In this story, Abraham sees three stra traveling strangers approaching his tent. Though they are divine beings, they are disguised as ordinary humans. Abraham offers them hospitality by hosting them in a sumptuous meal. And after the meal, the guests re reveal their true identity and reward Abraham for his hospitality. There is another version of the same story in the Quran, by the way. Jesus referred to this tradition at numerous points in his teachings. In Matthew 25, for example, he tells a parable of a ruler who disguises himself as a commoner in order to test the hospitality of his subjects. He then gathers those subjects to separate the sheep from the goats. The sheep are rewarded because they were hospitable to the king. The goats, those who were designated as such, were inhospitable and therefore are punished. When they ask, when did they in fact offer hospitality to the Lord, Jesus answers, when you did it for the least of these, you did it for me, thus following in the same theme as the Abraham story. In the letters of Paul, hospitality was a primary metaphor for the event of grace. In the phrase, as Christ has welcomed you, as a metaphor of grace, it would have been experienced in the ritual of hospitality extended to the community table. Welcome one another refers to the way in which care for the others at the table 
is to be just as hospitable as that of Jesus. Now these are some of the examples from the formative years of Christianity. There we go. <laughs> the meal gatherings of early Christians became formative for Christian identity and ritual in future generations. In later generations, the ritual known as the Eucharist or Lord's Supper continued the sharing of bread and wine together as a central sacrament of the Christian community. Gradually over time, the Eucharist became separated from the community meal as a separate ceremony. But the community meal continued in the form of a ritualized love feast. A ritual which, by the way, is still celebrated today uh, by some Christian communities. The community dinner has also been preserved in an informal sense, not with as much uh, a significant ritual, but in a nevertheless meaningful informal sense in the form of fellowship dinners which were a major part of the social formation of Christian communities, even if not always acknowledged that people do know that. Just as feasting was a central part of the ritual life of earliest Christianity, it continues to exist in the form of various feast days that dot the Christian religious calendar. The ritual of feasting also embedded within Christian identity the importance of hospitality to the stranger as a theology of breaking bread together with individuals across a wide spectrum of social, economic, and religious differences. A specific form of hospitality to the stranger is practiced in a variety of acts of charity, such as soup kitchens. So in conclusion, food and the ritual of dining, which were foundational for the formative years of Christianity, continue to be important in the theology and practice of Christianity. Thank you.